residence ban and this subject to final terms and conditions acceptable to the police chief and the city attorney. And then real quickly, I'll just, a uh, little history is just the evidence van is a critical piece of equipment for us and our ability to investigate major crimes. Uh, so due to COVID-19, which obviously none of us expected, over the last year has been significant delay in completing the construction upfitting of the van and at this time we've exhausted or I've exhausted all efforts to find a vendor that will take on the work or complete the project in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, we have located one vendor uh, up in Ferndale, which is Trivan Truck Body, that can complete the work by the end of the year. All right, anyone have any questions or comments? All right, is everyone good moving this forward to the consent calendar? All right, thank you. All right, thank you all. All right, up next we have an ordinance amending Chapter 15 of the Kent City Code consistent with House Bill 1220 and Haley Bonsteel. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to go back to B. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Go ahead, Haley. Okay. Happy to switch if that's helpful. Um, <laughs> okay. So I last presented to Committee of the Whole on uh, May 25th about House Bill 1220, and I let you all know that there were some code amendments coming down the pike based on this recently adopted legislation. So that is what I'm here to discuss. Tonight. So when I previously discussed the new law, I talked about uh, other components within the law, but tonight I'm just going to focus on those new regulations that are causing us to need to amend our code. So they're related to three types of housing, indoor emergency shelter, permanent supportive housing, transitional housing. There's new zoning parameters for those, and um, all of them may be subject to some requirements that um, we, we're going to go through sort of how we think we can address each of these. So I'm going to go one type by um, by another, it, it gets a little confusing. There's a lot of details, so we can always go back and adjust. But let's start with indoor emergency housing. So first of all, what is it? As defined in Kent City Codes, we already have a definition for this. This is a facility that provides a temporary housing within, an, within a building, and it's restricted in our zoning code to 90 days on, 90 days off. Obviously, this photo is not local with the palm trees, but you can see this is the type of thing we're talking about. It's generally a church. They put out a sign. There are beds. So, the new requirement is to allow this type of housing anywhere hotels are allowed. So we allow hotels in eight zones. Uh, those zones are located in downtown and Midway, and then um, a commercial manufacturing zone, general commercial and industrial one. And I have a zoning map on the next slide that we can pop to at any time. But basically we had to look at those eight zones and say, okay, indoor emergency housing is already allowed in five of them, the ones in downtown and Midway. Um, it also happens to be allowed in other zones, but most relevant is that those three zones um, on the end of that sentence, the CM, GC, and I-1, those are where we had to focus because we allow hotels, we don't yet allow indoor emergency housing. So our proposal is pretty simple. Allow that kind of housing within those three zones with the same conditional use permit requirements as we have in downtown and Midway. So those requirements are um, based on, you know, a lot of sensible things. I can just summarize them very quickly. They have to be one acre in size, a thousand foot spacing from other proposed facilities. Um, it sticks with that 90 days on, 90 days off. And, you know, it requires a proposed staffing and operational characteristics, kind of a plan for like, how is this going to be a success? So that's probably the simplest. Um, let's jump to the next most complicated one. Oh, yeah. And here's the zoning, by the way. Um, the CM, I don't know if this works. The CM zone is over here on 99. GC is sort of in the middle of the city. And then I-1 is, of course, our industrial zoning district um, throughout the valley. So we discussed when I presented to you last time that there were a few other options. This is our proposal. We can discuss the other options if needed. Um, but specifically, I would say that one of them would involve a lot more residential zones. We didn't think that was probably desired. And uh, so this is sort of our, our way forward. All right, let's talk about the next one, permanent supportive housing. So this slide is from that previous presentation because they did add a new definition within the statute for this housing type. It's leased um, with no length of stay. So it's, you know, it's, it's, that's why it's called permanent. And it prioritizes people who um, might be harder to lease to otherwise. It's paired with on-site or off-site voluntary services. And all those things sound well and good, but what is it really? It's an apartment building. We know one of these, we have them here in Kent, the Abowman Apartments over in the Midway area. Um, you know, from a land use or architectural perspective, it's any other multifamily building. Um, so because there's nothing in the definition that's specific to built form, 
And because this, this statute hadn't been adopted yet as well, when the Theobomen Apartments came into Kent, we permitted them as multifamily. So our proposal is to essentially keep doing that. Um, but of course there's a wrinkle because there's always a wrinkle. So the new requirement is to allow this housing type, PSH we call it, permanent supportive housing, in any zones in which dwelling units or hotels are allowed. So dwelling units obviously are allowed in multifamily and single family zones, as well as mixed use zones. And hotels again are also allowed in mixed use commercial and industrial. So we now have to account for how are we going to allow PSH in all of those different zones? We do not have a definition of permanent supportive housing in the zoning code and we're not proposing to add one. And the reason is that, as I described earlier, it fundamentally is multifamily housing. However, since the statute is written such that, that would, a, an, a strict interpretation would allow multifamily in single family, we don't think that's the intent of the bill and so we are proposing to incorporate permanent supportive housing into the definition of a class one group home. So um, other group homes include adult family homes, state licensed foster family homes, um, group homes for individuals who are developmentally, physically or mentally disabled, um, halfway houses, that kind of thing. All of them have a maximum of six residents. So what that basically means is this is a structure that is more appropriate for a single family area as compared to a larger structure. So with this in mind, that rather than create a new definition, we want to incorporate permanent supportive housing into existing definitions within our zoning code in order to be able to effectively zone permanent supportive housing per this new bill. Our proposal is as follows. When we go through each of the types of zones, we already allow multifamily in multifamily. Great, that one's easy. In single family zones, we're proposing to allow group homes functioning as permanent supportive housing with a thousand foot spacing requirement from both each other and from um, public schools. And the reason we chose public schools, of course, is that that's a lot easier for us to enforce than any kind of school. And once you start the list of all the kinds of things that you may want to have a distance from, uh, it becomes really difficult to possibly uh, be able to assess all those, um, all those proximal use uses. So we kind of went with like one basic level of, let's keep them a thousand feet apart and from schools other than that, we feel that they can integrate into single family zones. If permanent supportive housing ever were to be developed as group homes, which to be clear, that is not what it typically is. It typically is an apartment building. But if, if anybody wanted to get creative and do this, this would allow them to do it per the statute. In commercial and mixed use zones, we would allow permanent supportive housing just the same as we allow multifamily, which is within our mixed use overlay, subject to all of the same requirements that we would ask of any apartment building. And then in industrial commercial zones, this is the tricky one because, you know, um, there are a lot of folks, not just us, who are really invested in industrial zones being places of economic development and residential uses can really outcompete uh, industrial uses as an example. And so we decided to restrict multifamily only to where hotels exist today to try to meet the intent of the law uh, without allowing some unintended consequences such as a proliferation of apartment buildings in our industrial zone. So I know that's a lot of details, but that is how we're trying to get through permanent supportive housing. Transitional housing, a little bit easier. It's kind of in between the last two we just described. It's a facility that is again, um, providing housing to people on a temporary basis. So it's not permanent, but it's a longer time period. So it's not to exceed two years. And it's generally again, in conjunction with some kind of training or services. My understanding is that this model is not favored by funders anymore. We do have some operating in Kent today. We do have some existing. So the new requirement for this one is again to allow it in any zones in which dwelling units or hotels are allowed. We already allow it in most multifamily zones and in all mixed use. So we're kind of looking at the, those same categories we described earlier of how are we going to allow it in single family in the rest of the multifamily in an I-1. You can see the proposal at the bottom. It's to allow in single family zones as a minor conditional use permit Again, same as uh, we have in, in other areas, allow in remaining multifamily zones, those that were not yet captured, and allow in the, our industrial district where hotels exist today. On the hotel front, I will say, you know, another option we had was to perhaps not allow hotels in some of those places, but that would sort of be counter to some of our other economic development goals, especially after Rally the Valley, you know, really brought home the importance of hotels. And so that's why we're, we're kind of threading the needle there. So. We went to the Land Use and Planning Board in July and they recommended approval. 
Uh, I'm here today, would like, would love for this to be on consent next week because that would give us an effective date of mid-September and we have this deadline that's built into the bill. Our legal folks have advised us that meeting that deadline for the effective date of the ordinance ensures maximum flexibility to adapt these over time. So there was a, a piece of the bill that said, you know, if something isn't on the books by September 30th, then uh, you have fewer options essentially. So that's all a way to say that, you know, there's probably a lot of questions about this. This was a very fast timeline. We were not able to necessarily speak to everybody in the world about their feelings about it. Um, but fundamentally, you know, every Kent legislature, every Kent legislator uh, voted in favor of this bill. And so this is really like being handed down from on high and we are doing our best to meet the intent of it, um, despite its kind of funkiness and how it's written. So I have a couple more stats and things if people have questions, but I think, um, I can go ahead and end there and, and take any questions. Council Member Boyce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, uh, Haley. Um, I'm curious for the Land Use Planning Board, number one, was that unanimous came out of there? Yes. And then second, I'm just curious about your um, peers in the other city. Um, have you having a conversation with them and how they're approaching this issue? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're all in the same boat. Uh, nobody has any magical answers yet because of how recently the bill was adopted. Um, I do know that some other cities in, this, in South County were considering a similar approach to us of, of group homes. Um, I think that was sort of a, a unique way of going about it that others sort of picked up on. I didn't hear any other um, particularly specific requirements that anybody was putting on. I do think that other cities may be, I'm, this is kind of a, a guess, but I'm guessing that other cities may put more, um, may define permanent supportive housing on its own and put more uh, burdens essentially on it and say, well, it needs to be spaced and all these other things. I think that what the approach we're taking is to say, you know, permanent supportive housing is already here. It's coming more. It's, you know, it seems to work so far. It's the favored approach of funders right now. Let's open our doors to that and, you know, treat it like the um, sort of the fact it is, which is a building. And these other types maybe are the ones that we want to be a little more concerned about. So. That's kind of the approach that um, that we've been working with, and I, I think it's it's a good one for now. And again, we can always adjust if it turns out that we get a deluge of these. Okay. And the last piece I'll just say is that the comprehensive plan next year, or the Department of Commerce next year, will provide numbers on all of these of how many of these we're supposed to be planning for. That will be a major opportunity for us and all cities to adjust whether or not their regulations allow for the number to be built that we're projected we need. Got it. Thanks a lot, Haley. Anybody else have questions? Did you have any additional? That's all for me. Okay. So um, we have this before you. It is uh, for Ordinance 4410, moving that forward to consent. Everyone okay? I know we've talked about this quite a bit, so. Wonderful. Thank you, Haley. Thank you. All right. We are going to back it up one uh, to the Kent School District Policy Service Agreement, and I'd like to welcome Commander Phil Johnson to present that information. Well, greetings. Thank you, council members, and everybody for your time and consideration with this matter. <clears throat> the purpose of this motion is to authorize the mayor to sign the police services and school resource officer agreements between the Kent Police Department and the Kent School District for the 2021 and the 2021-22 school years to provide school safety liaison and two school resource officers. This subject uh, is the final terms to this agreement are subject to the conditions acceptable to both the police chief and the city attorney's office. We've par partnered with the school district for many years now in this capacity and it's been beneficial to all the external stakeholders and all stakeholders involved. Uh, the agreements further the police department's effort to engage within the community and also assist with the development and the education of our youth. The specific agreement is a little unique in that it does cover two different school years, both the 2021 and the 21-22 school years for initial two-year term with the options to extend the term of the contract up to five successive periods of 12 months each. The agreement for the 2021 uh, school year was not executed primarily due to the COVID pandemic and the reason why it's being built into this agreement to memorialize that. The agreement fulfills the requirements of RCW 28A320 
124 subsection 2 which requires the agreement between the school districts and the local law enforcement for an implementation of a school resource officer program and specific elements that must be incorporated into such an agreement. Uh, the agreement also fulfills the requirements of RCW 10.93.160, which formalizes and clarifies the partnership between the school district and the police department. And the House Bill 1214 is also incorporated into this agreement as well. If this motion is granted, the agreement signed by all parties, the school district's obligation for the school resource officers is 60% of the total cost of the police department for salary and benefits and 25% for the liaison's salary and benefits. I previously submitted the supporting documents with the motion uh, today in advance for your review, and if there's any questions that you might have in regards to this motion, I'm um, willing to help try to provide any clarification or any other information. And again, thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, any questions? And Chief, I see you standing by. I know Council Member Larmer isn't here this evening, but she had some questions that um, I know she presented to you earlier. Yes, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. There were two questions that uh, Council Member Larmer asked me to put on record, so I'm going to go through those and then provide the answer. I'll read from an excerpt from an email I got. It says, uh, our concern is that it sounds like we will be operating without required guidance and clarification on roles, responsibilities, and agreed methodologies. I worry that the absence of, of this KSD provided policy and procedure sets us up for potential conflict and or liability. I would feel much better about entering into the SRO agreement with the policy and procedure agreement in place beforehand. So that's, I, I, so there's a statement. So I'll, I would answer to that in saying I agree. Um, we have, uh, you guys are well aware, we have had uh, troubles over the years getting a contract on time. Um, and I won't go into whose fault that is, but I'll just say it's not ours. Um, and um, this year we were pretty adamant and with, with feedback from the council that we had to have a signed contract before we started the new year and put officers back in the schools. And so we, in an effort to do that, the school district is working very hard to get those policies and procedures done. They are not done as of today. I understand that there's a board meeting tomorrow to go over if, what will be close to a final draft. And the school board is hoping to have them in place by the start of the school. I think it's August 26th, first day of school. So that's our point. As a contingency to that, while we wait for the policies and procedures to get hammered out, we will just pull our officers to a position where they'll only respond to emergency type incidents, which would not be impacted by the new policies and procedures. Okay? Um, I expect that we're going to get the, the paperwork done in time, but we need a stopgap measure to not forestall this uh, and get the contract signed before the start of the school year. Any questions to that answer? Concerns? Okay. And then her second question was regarding how the schools were chosen. Um, there are, you know, multiple high schools and multiple uh, middle schools in the district. And so this agreement is for the two high schools and the two middle schools that are in the Kent city limits, which is what we cover. Um, school resource officers are dealt with for the others through, through King County as they're in unincorporated areas. And so they do have um, at least partial cover, if not complete coverage of the schools through King County Sheriff's Office. Council Member Thomas, do you have a question? I think so. Uh, Chief, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the new school is being built on 208th and 108th. Is that a middle school? I th is, is that the new Phoenix Academy kind of thing or the new Sequoia Junior High? Or I, I'm not sure, but isn't that? It is a replacement for the Phoenix Academy is my understanding. And I think it'll be, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but it'll be an alternative education uh, platform. So, so that school would be included as well? Um, it could be at a later time. We'd want to look at the contract. Traditionally, we did not cover Phoenix right. Academy. Right. Um, it was uh, because of the formatting and whatnot, but it could be something we'd look at later. It'd really be up to the school district if that if they wanted that coverage. Okay. Thank you very much. Council Member Michelle. Thank you, Council President. So, Chief, my question is about um, we're, the school district will give us 60% of the cost for the officers. Are the officers there all day? And then, like, what do they do in the summer? How much of the officers' time is spent with the school? Great question. During the actual school year, it's almost 100% at the school. 
During the summers, we reserve the right to put them back to uniform patrol staffing. Uh, in years past, we've used them for auxiliary units such as uh, the boat unit, uh, some of our bike unit operations, but we supplement summertime staffing with them, so that's the 60-40 split. Um, but during the school year, they're there. They're there for football games, other security details, graduation. Um, and leading into each summer, our officers uh, provide, I think it's two weeks of refresher training on laws and procedures to all the safety staff there every year. So they do go back early for that. And how many officers are SROs? It, there are, we have currently have two. So one takes care of... Uh, uh, KM and one takes care of Kent Ridge. So just kind of following up with Councilmember Michaud, um, are those two officers that we have, are, have they been in the schools already? Because I know there's talk about building, you know, relationships and kind of that mentoring piece. So are they the same officers that we've had in the past? They are. So our current two, um, one officer has several years on at Kent Ridge and the other officer has, I believe, at least two years in that role. Uh, they've been through all the advanced training, the specialized um, training they give to relating to students and youth and some of the sensitive issues they dealt with in terms of uh, the majority of their calls, actually, police calls, other than just being there and being, being amongst the students, is they get a lot of for, um, what mandatory reporting calls. So you're talking about neglect and abuse and things of that nature. That's where you see the law enforcement part of this come into play more often than not. We looked at our numbers a couple of years ago, and there were a total of three arrests made in one year. Two of those were adults who had unlawfully come on school campus, and the third was the student had brought a firearm to school. That was it. Um, that was the amount of arrests made. Councilmember Boyce. Councilmember Cor. Thank you, uh, Chief. Uh, thank you for answering Councilmember Larmer's questions because I had similar concerns. Be the other one is about the training for these officers. I know that with the new law, there's a changes in the training. Do we know like timeline on that? Is that going to be done before the school year, or what's what's happening there? I have no idea. Yeah, I I do not have a good answer for you other than to say as soon as the training becomes available, we will move on that right away. Um, I, I have heard that King County has maybe already uh, put some of their deputies through that, so we'd want to look at that. But currently, we're, we do not, to my knowledge, haven't attended the training. So. so we don't have to have our officers trained before they go into the schools with, under the new law, or is that? I'm getting I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I can answer that. Uh, last year, <clears throat> I want to, when I took on this role in March, I believe it was in April that they went through the state certified training that is uh, incorporated into the house bills. I think there's 13 different topics that are uh, uh, put on through the officer of the superintendent and both uh, of our officers have been through all of that certified training uh, for those uh, things. One of the things that we are doing with the police department is to make sure that we have record of that so we have it within our internally within the police department but all of the training that is necessary for the house bills and the RCW, associated RCWs has, has been completed by both of our officers. Council Member Boyce. The, you might have <laughs> thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I, I want to say, um, most of you guys know I spent 16 years on the uh, Kent School Board Education and um, I think that the SROs as well as the uh, police officers have been a Good experience when I was on the uh, on the uh, school board, and I also I reach out to uh, some of the um, uh, school board members. Just kind of want to get their thought on it. Um, I spoke with uh, school board member Denise McDaniel and Meyer V. I messed her name up, so I'm not going to mess it up. But they both strongly uh, support this here and want to see this happening. I uh, also talked to Wade Barringer, who is used to be the principal at KM for many, many years now. He's the interim uh, HR chief and uh, strongly support it. He thinks this is something we need to continue to do. And the uh, current interim chief, Israel Vela, uh, spoke to him as well, too. Uh, strongly support it. I got a call out to Mike Albrecht, so I'm just checking to make sure that, you know, this is a good thing to do. As far as the training go, there's a seven days training. It had been completed. They all been through the training already. Uh, what I was told uh, a few days ago. Um, no, I just think, you know, um, 
The kids, even my kids today, they have a good experience out of school, and they remember the SROs and the police officer uh, seeing them have a good relationship. But sometimes they the, they the front to things that happen, you know, before things really happen, and they're really uh, able to uh, build up a, a, a good rapport and uh, and relationship uh, with them. So, I, uh, um, I mean, we are providing a service to the school. This is something the school is asking for. Um, and, and I do know on their August 25th board meeting, uh, they are planning on adopting this year. So uh, at least the two board members that I talked to, um, they don't see any reason why this won't get adopted, but you don't know until you know, right? But they are on the right path for uh, adopting this year. So I, um, from what I'm hearing, this is something that the school want to continue to do. I think the training and accountability, you know, is something when I talked to most of the board member. Uh, uh, this is something that they feel like need to continue to do or, and is in place today. So that was their main concern around the training and accountability, and they feel really good about that. I wasn't reached out to the other board member. haven't had time yet, but I probably will between now and our next meeting. But it sounds like this is something positive that the, uh, that the uh, school want to move forward with. So just want to share that. Thank you. Thank you for that information, Council Member Boyce. Any other questions or comments? All right, so we have this agreement before us. Is everyone okay moving this forward to the consent calendar? All right, wonderful. Thank you, Commander Donson and Chief. Moving on in the agenda, we have the Consolidating Budget Adjustment Ordinance for adjustments between April 1st and June 30th, and this also requires action. Welcome, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon. I am Michelle Ferguson, the Financial Planning Manager, and I'll be presenting the Consolidated Budget Adjustments for uh, the second quarter of 2021. The second quarter adjustment is reflecting an overall budget increase of $23,845,656. Previously approved budget expenditure increases total $10,642,160, and budget adjustments that have not been previously approved by council total $13,203,496. So for the majority of this presentation, I'll be using rounded numbers, but the ordinance and exhibits do contain the exact budget expenditure figures. Uh, the expenditure increases of 10.6 million that council has previously approved include 8.1 million in grants and 2.5 million in carry forward budgets from 2020. The grants included in this budget change are uh, 7.35 million from the King County Flood Control District for the Milwaukee 2 levy project that was approved by council last September. 700,000 in grants from the Washington State Department of Transportation for the South 212 East Valley Highway 76 project and that was approved by council in May. And then there are a combination of four small grants that total 77,000, which include 50,000 from the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services for a Community Immersion Program grant, 10,000 for a Washington State Boat grant, 5,000 from King County for a Youth Marijuana Prevention grant, and 12,000 from the Washington State Office of Public Defense for an Indigent Council grant. So Parks had carry for budgets that totaled 2.5 million that are included in this amendment. 473,000 are in the general fund, which includes carry forward for human services, youth initial, initiative professional services, a museum feasibility study, park impact fee consultant, and a marketing photo contract. 394,000 in carry forward budgets are in the capital resources fund for parks major maintenance life cycle projects. There's also 70,000 in the Human Services Fund for the Homeless Planner Contract and 1.58 million in the Facilities Fund. So 1.35 are for life cycle projects and 225 are for the Facilities Master Plan update. Michelle, if you don't mind, Councilmember Thomas has a question. Uh, Michelle, up there in that 77,000 for four mini grants. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned there was 5,000 given for marijuana prevention. Yes. Is that, where does that come from? King County. And does King County share that same amount to all the other cities? 
I'm not sure if it's based on population or it's just a Because most of the other cities allow marijuana. I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. You just um, we can ask police and get back to you. This is a police grant. It wouldn't hurt because if nobody else is getting it, it seems like 5000 is not very much to be given to one of the few cities that does prevent marijuana in their city. So if you wouldn't mind kind of looking in that and get back to me or the rest of the council, thank you very much. And thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so there are the remaining adjustments that total 13.2 million council has not approved. And there are increases that total 13.45 million and decreases that total 274,000. The 274,000 include a reduction of 197,000 to the Lake Fenwick aeration system project. Uh, too much was budgeted, was added to the project, and the budget needs to be reduced to reflect the correct sub-regional opportunity fund amount. There's also a budget reduction of 50,000 to remove uh, the general fund expense allocation to the lodging tax fund, and a budget reduction of 100. And $74 has been processed to true up the CDBG HUD allocation. Uh, HUD made an error on their calculation that resulted in a decrease to our 2020 funding. So for the remaining $13.45 million in increased budget amendments, over 3.6 has been counted for twice for accounting purposes. So we have to budget the transfer out and then the expense within the project. Uh, budget change for $4.5 Four million is completed to transfer general fund reserves to the liability fund to cover a shortfall due to rising costs of liability insurance, claims experience, and required fund reserves. A budget change of 4.12 million is needed for the new affordable housing sales tax. When the 21-22 budget was established, only a very small portion of the House Bill 1590 revenues and related expenditures were part of the 21-22 adopted budget. And this budget change will fully budget this new revenue and related expenditures. 60% of these funds will be budgeted in a project and the remaining 40% in an operating account. So 60%, which is about 1.68 million, will be transferred out of the Human Services Fund and into the project. And then the 1.68 will be budgeted within the project for use of these funds. And the remaining 40%, which is about 1.02 million, will be budgeted in the fund as an operating expense. And uh, due to some budgeting differences between 1406 and 1590, which are in the same fund, a reduction of 130,000 is needed in the 1406 project. Um, so there is a 1.78 million budget change for the cable utility tax, and this is due to the state auditor's office no longer accepting taxes being collected directly into the in internal service fund. So currently they're going into the IT fund. Now they need to go into the general fund. So a budget change of 1.78 is needed to transfer these revenues from the general fund to the IT fund. There's also a budget change needed of 1.5 million in the drainage fund for the cleaning of culverts through Mill Creek. So 750,000 will be transferred out of the drainage fund and into the Mill Creek culvert cleaning project and 750 will be budgeted in the project to use. There's also a budget change for 442,000 for three projects within the utility funds. The amount will cover the transfer out and the use within those projects, which are 60,000 for replacing the programmable logic controller at operations, which monitors alarms for all three utilities. 214,000 for radio replacements for all the radios that communicate with the controller, and 270,000 for water main replacements on Pioneer, Titus, and SAR streets. And coming to the end here, we have 270,000 is needed for the driving range expansion and remodel project. $220,000 of these funds will come from the facilities fund, and 50,000 will come from King County levy funds. And $175,000 budget amendment is needed to transfer 87,000 of residual 2020 B&O tax revenues out of the general fund and then budget the use of those funds within projects. So 32,000 will be budgeted in the fourth and Willis projects and 55,000 will be budgeted in the parks planning project. Are there any questions? Questions for Michelle. All right.
right. Everyone okay moving this forward, these adjustments to the consent calendar? All right. Thank you, Michelle. I will let you move on to the financial report for June. Okay. So I'll be presenting an overview of the monthly financial report for June 2021. Highlighted on this slide are the property tax revenues, and as you can see, um, it looks like May and June actuals seem to be lower than they were last year at this time, but when you combine April, May, and June together, um, you can see that the revenues are 3% higher than they were a year ago at this time. So if you recall, King County extended the deadline for property tax payments in June of 2020, and that's why the revenues are lower in April, but higher in June. So the other revenues are highlighted at the bottom of this slide. And uh, so other revenues consist of intergovernmental licenses and permits, charges for services, fines and fortunes, forfeitures, and other miscellaneous revenues. So the city is slowly starting to see improvements in these revenues, as you can see, compared to last year. Um, the revenues for licenses and permits and charges for services are the categories that have seen the most growth in the last month, especially in ECD and fire. Uh, highlighted on this slide are the utility tax and the B&O taxes, and it's only because when you look at percent of budget, it seems like they're lower. The utility tax is what I just talked about before, that cable utility tax coming into the general fund. We budgeted um, the revenues, but the actuals haven't been transferred yet, and so next month on the report, you'll see that number shift up to be over 50%. And B&O tax is because we only have seen the first quarter payment so far. This, in July, those payments have come in. So on the next report, you'll see that closer to that 50% or higher. And um, for expenditures, you would expect to see about 50% of expenditures since half the year is over. And you can see that just about every department has come in under budget and significantly. Uh, the B&O seem a little higher than the previous yes. uh, two years. Um, uh, increase the gross receipts um, rates. Hmm. I would expect that to be less based on the COVID. That's not the case there. Nope. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of yeah. um, lower revenues because of that. Uh, slightly lower, but not significant. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, the left one retiree. Uh, benefits fund is highlighted on this slide, and that is just because um, it might look like there's an anomaly in 2021 compared to 2020, and that is just because of a timing issue when they process the revenues in prior years. We're not seeing it any more than we normally would expect. And then capital resources fund has been highlighted, and that is to show that we have received um, the back payment of SST revenues that has been restored from the state. So we received 3.6 million last month in revenues, and um, starting in September, the quarterly payments will return, which will be a little over 900,000 um, quarterly, and then drop off 20% each year until they're at nothing. And criminal justice revenues have been highlighted as well, just to show um, how well this fund is doing um, since we're kind of coming out of COVID, hopefully. Uh, the um, school zone camera revenues totaled 255,000 last month and red light camera revenues totaled 237,000, which is a 15% increase from May revenues and a 45% increase from the same time last year. Um, on this slide, I highlighted fleet services expenditures. It looks like um, their expenditures are less than they are, and that is due to uh, they have two vacancies for mechanics as well as their budget for replacement vehicles is lower than it was in prior years. Prior years, they were using up some fund balance and buying some extra vehicles, and now it's returned to kind of normal levels. And the last one highlighted was liability insurance and the that is because of that 4.4 million transfer in from the general fund, which is making that variance look quite large. <laughs> yeah. Is there any questions? Any questions for Michelle? So everything looks good except for that piece, but we've talked about that multiple times. So. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, up next we have, Paul is gonna talk about the U.S. Small Business Administration um, Operations Grant for Showware. Thank you, Council President Troutner and members of City Council. Thank you for having me here tonight. As you can imagine, the live venues um, have definitely been impacted due to COVID. So our Shower Center has been closed for a very long time because of the pandemic, all the restrictions that were on the gathering um, in public places. And luckily, there is an opportunity to take advantage of a grant through the Shuttered Venue Grant a Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, excuse me. Um, the city did apply for that grant. Um, there were $16 billion that were available to like venues, and the city applied for the grant, was awarded just over $3 million from that grant. Um, that grant, those dollars will be able to use um, to help the Shower Center to cover some of the costs that were incurred between March of 2020 and December of 2021. So what you're looking at, those are payroll costs, um, cost, uh, other costs to be able to do business, utility payments, any costs that they have related to any of the contractual agreements that they have in place. In addition to that, some administrative costs. So tonight what I'm coming here asking for is for you to ratify the mayor's execution of a notice of award for this grant and the authorization to be able to receive those funds. The reason why we have to do the ratification is really it was a timing issue. On Saturday, July 17th, we received notice that the city will be awarded $3 million. However, there was a little bit of a technical glitch that we had to get resolved before we would be able to finalize that acceptance. That was not resolved until July 22nd. We had two days to get that document signed and submitted by July 24th, which was the deadline. Uh, that did not allow us enough time to be able to come to council to get that authorization before signing it and not wanting to miss out on this fantastic opportunity to, um, to have over $3 million in grant funding. The mayor did sign that contract. So on July 29th, if you can see how quickly this is all moving, the city actually did receive $3,050,000 and some change in a grant from the U.S. Small Business Administration for that. So tonight I'm coming and asking to ratify that um, execution of notice for the award. And I would be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Great work, Paula. Any questions? Um, just, I just have a quick one. Does it have to be used for specific reimbursement? Yeah, categories? it does. So what it what happened is when when the application went in, we had to talk about what were the expenditures that the Shower Center had faced um, during the that time period of March till till now. So the costs are really specific to be used for uh, personnel in the in the total of one point eight million dollars contractual agreements for about $111 million. Um, other areas, uh, utility payments for $390,000. Um, ordinary and normal business expenses at $295,000 and administrative costs of around $403,000. What I can say about those is those are approximates. They're, they do have some wiggle room, but their wiggle room is very small. It's about 10% in either direction of these figures that I've, I've shared with you. Um, so they will be monitoring to making sure that we're using it for what we have said that we need those funds for. Right. All right, is everyone okay accepting this? Perfect, good Thank news. You. Thank you, Paula. All right, up next we have NetMotion Mobility Renewal and James Endicott. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, James Endicott with uh, Infra sorry, Infrastructure and Security Operations Center within IT. Uh, today I'm here to request authorization to purchase net motion licensing uh, through the state's Department of Enterprise Services uh, cooperative agreement. Um, net motion, just maybe for some education, is our VPN software that we use that allows people that are on the outside, city staff outside of our network, to connect back into um, the city network, as well provide, provides a layer of security for our devices. Um, 
With this approval, we seek uh, future purchases through the end of the contract, which is through January of 22, and then any subsequent um, extensions that they offer, as long as those purchases are within IT's established budgets. Uh, anybody, anybody have any questions? All right, makes sense. Any questions? You Every yet changed any <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, is everyone okay moving yeah. this forward to the consent calendar? Perfect. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, we are moving right along. Next up, we have a resolution ratifying the Ryan 9 Salmon Habitat Plan. This requires council motion and Mike McTutis. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mike McTutis. I'm the environmental manager for the city. Uh, with me tonight is Matt Goring, who is the salmon recovery manager for uh, the water resource inventory area 9, which is the Green Duwamish watershed. Uh, so uh, the proposal for you tonight is uh, to ratify an updated version of the Salmon Habitat Plan. Uh, the current version was ratified by the city as well as 16 other jurisdictions in 2005. So the science has, has advanced, the land uses have advanced as, uh, as well as the policies. Uh, so uh, the city has reviewed this, has participated in the preparation of this through uh, technical staff with uh, public works, uh, economic and community development as well as parks um, as well as um, uh, Council President Troutner on the management committee for the Salmon Recovery Council and, and uh, Mayor Ralph uh, participating for the city on the, the forum. Uh, so Matt is going to give a short presentation on some of the updates in the plan. Thank you Mike. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to speak to you about salmon recovery in the Green Duwamish watershed. As Mike said, my name is Matt Goring, and I'm the salmon recovery manager for Rad 9. So it should be no surprise to anyone here that Puget Sound Chinook have experienced a sustained decline over the last 150 years. This decline culminated with the listing of Puget Sound Chinook under the Endangered Species Act in 1999. In response to that listing, the state created a framework for local watershed-based organizations to provide the backbone for salmon recovery efforts across our state. These organizations, such as RIA 9, helped bring together diverse partners in support of building uh, a network for salmon recovery. In 2001, uh, the 17 local governments in our watershed bound together in an interlocal agreement to collectively support local salmon recovery. Uh, the ILA recognized that ultimately recovery would depend on a collective lift across the watershed. So in 2005, RIA 9 released its first recovery plan. Uh, that plan ultimately became a chapter of the regional Puget Sound recovery plan in 2007. And this plan since then has served as the blueprint for salmon recovery across the watershed. Since that time, the ILA has been renewed twice and the current ILA extends through 2025. So Ryan is a diverse landscape. It spans about 575 square miles, ranging from the industrial, let's see if I can use the pointer. Whoop, nope. Oh, let's see. Nope, how do I, there we go. Do you know how to use the pointer? Ah, we'll skip it. Try the top one. <laughs> I was going to use the pointer, but I'll skip it. So from the industrial Seattle waterfront up into the U.S. Forest Service lands. Or, Turn the button. Oh, there we go. The industrial Seattle waterfront all the way to the U.S. Forest Service lands along the crest of the Cascades. Uh, so the, out, the ILA outlines a watershed-based approach that applies best available science to identifying limiting factors and prioritizing those actions across the watershed which are expected to provide the greatest lift to salmon recovery. So in support of the interlocal agreement, RIA 9 staffs a watershed ecosystem forum which oversees the RIA 9 work program and has decision-making authority around funding as well as planning-related initiatives. This forum includes representatives from across the whole watershed, including all of our local government partners. So we've been fortunate, as Mike said, to have Mayor Ralph serve on uh, the forum since 2014, and more recently, Council President Tony Troutner serving on uh, the management committee as the chair. 
So since its inception, the Ryan 9 construct has been successful in securing local, state, and federal funds. With approximately $200 million of funding, our partners have been able to make significant strides with respect to habitat achievements across the watershed. You don't have to look far in the city of Kent to see, uh, see these investments on the ground. On the upper right is Riverview Park. This was a $3 million project completed in 2013 in partnership with the Army Corps. And uh, it ended up creating this 750 foot side channel, which supports uh, juvenile salmon uh, rearing and survival and growth on their downstream migration. Uh, and then on the lower right is Mill Creek Lieber Homestead. And this was a $2.5 million project completed in 2016. Uh, so this not only enhanced salmon habitat, but also provided 50 acres of additional flood, acre feet of flood storage capacity. So and I just want to take a moment down here on the, the lower left to thank uh, the city of Kent uh, for their long-term support. Over the last 20 years, ILA cost share partners collectively have contributed $8.4 million to the program. This is a significant investment, and it's helped build our collaborative partnership and position the watershed for the success we've been able to achieve. Councilmember Thomas, do you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. On, on your chart here, you, you do list the 17 communities here, and it does add up to be 17. You got Tacoma listed twice. Do I have it listed? Is that supposed to be Tukwila, perhaps? Yes, you're right. So, okay. Thank okay. you for correct, <laughs> catching that. Yes. So, uh, uh, yeah, Tuck, it should be Tukwila okay. and Tacoma, although it's obviously not the, uh, s within the city limits, it's their, uh, their uh, water source, yep. the upper watershed. Thank you. Yeah. So this slide just is a, a quick look at uh, Green River Chinook numbers since 1990. Uh, as you can see, the, the green line here depicts wild fish and the blue line depicts total fish, including hatchery fish. So despite the progress we just kind of ran through, we really haven't been able to turn the tide with respect to Chinook numbers. Uh, and following ESA listing, as you, if you look there at 2009, the numbers crashed to an all-time low of 165 fish. Yeah, 165 fish in the entire watershed, wild fish. Uh, it was scary. Uh, so although numbers have rebounded somewhat since then, still in five out of the last 10 years, numbers re remain below our short-term planning target of 1,000 to 4,200 fish. This trend isn't unique to Raya 9. It can be seen across Puget Sound, and it, it highlights the need to accelerate our work. So fast forward to the plan update under consideration today. Um, the plan update represents the next chapter of salmon recovery in our watershed. The update process validated the strength of the original 2005 plan. And as a, as a result, the update is really more of a series of tweaks and modification than a comprehensive overall. With new and best available science, it provides an updated framework for identifying and priority, prioritizing recovery actions across the watershed. The plan contains policy and programmatic actions embedded in 11 overarching recovery strategies, and it also provides an updated capital project list of 118 conceptual ideas. These ideas were developed in cooperation with all of our local partners. So this slide just highlights that each of the five sub-watersheds within Raya 9 play an important role with respect to the life cycle of salmon. The city of Kent lies squarely within the lower green sub-watershed that extends from about Auburn downstream to about the 405 freeway. In addition to supporting upstream adult migration, as well as some spawning in the upper reaches, the lower green really serves a critical function for juvenile salmon growth and survival. Fish depend on the shallow, slow water habitats in this area for food production and refuge from high, uh, high flows. Without adequate habitat, juvenile fish can be flushed downstream prematurely where they experience very low survival rates. So in terms of uh, recovery strategies, there's a number of recovery strategies outlined for the lower green uh, sub-watershed. The key ones really focus on restoring floodplain connectivity to increase juvenile rearing habitat, revegetating riparian corridors to increase shade and help reduce in-stream water temperatures, 
and protecting and enhancing water quality and water flows. And so, you know, looking at these pictures on the right, uh, looking around in the lower green, it's a really challenging landscape to work within. As shown in these images, it's a heavily developed area, land availability is scarce, and the need for flood protection is undoubtedly real. So in order to obtain, obtain progress in areas like this, we really got to start looking at multi-benefit projects that advance not only flood risk reduction, but also things like recreational opportunity and salmon habitat. So these pictures here uh, on the, uh, the upper right, that's an image of the flood control system around State Route F6, F516 and 167. And uh, you can obviously see how close these residential homes are to the, to the levee in the city of Auburn. So with respect to projects in the lower green, the plan update has 45 uh, individual conceptual project ideas. 18 of these are located in Kent. These range uh, from active projects underway. You have undoubtedly heard about Dar Downey Farmstead and Lower Russell Road, which are under construction now. Other projects like Twofold Nursery and Johnson Creek Floodplain, they're conceptual ideas at this point. They're not active. Uh, so they're just potential opportunities that could be considered in the future. So RIA 9 is committed to working with all of our partners to support implementation. This commitment can be seen in the recent multi-year push to fully fund Downey Farmstead. It is exciting to see that this project is now fully funded and scheduled for completion in 2022. The RIA develops an annual funding package that it presents to the Watershed Ecosystem Forum every year at its May quarterly meeting. And primary funding sources include cooperative watershed management funds from the Flood Control District, as well as several uh, state salmon recovery grants funds. So Ryan 9 in terms of forward planning, Ryan 9 maintains a six-year project implementation plans. We work with all of our partners, including the City of Kent, to understand their needs looking forward so we can uh, best meet those needs financially. Uh, and so uh, the Watershed Ecosystem Forum unanimously approved the plan update back in February. The final step, as Mike mentioned, is local ratification. Uh, ratification acknowledges that all local government partners support the plan and are collaboratively working to support plan implementation. It also acknowledges that salmon recovery is not a standalone initiative. It's inherently embedded in other, other community priorities, such as uh, flood risk reduction, stormwater, and recreation. As such, we really should be taking a multi-benefit approach. And finally, ratification recognizes that the plan is an important new source of best available science that can and should help inform local action. So with that, before I open it up to any questions, I just want to acknowledge the rest of the RIA 9 team. Although we're housed in King County, we really are the collective staff of the Watershed Ecosystem Forum. And as such, I just want to emphasize that we stand ready to support the city of Kent in advancing their salmon recovery priorities. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. It's, first of all, it's great to see you in person because I think it's been quite some time. Um, any questions for Matt about this plan? I know it was a huge project to put together, and I know the city of Kent and staff contributed quite a bit to helping um, mold what, what we have before us today. So thank you so much for that, and thank you, Mike, for all the work that you do for this. But I just have to say this partnership is so important. As you can see, the benefits that Kent has received um, you know, from this multi-benefit plan of you know, protecting people from flood, but also all of the work we do for salmon habitat. And I want to thank you for being here and sharing that with us today. Yeah, I appreciate thank it. You. Yeah, you know, the partnership really is, is only as strong as all of our partners. And Kent's been there front and center along the way. So really appreciate the ongoing support. Absolutely. All right. Is everyone okay moving this forward to the consent calendar? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have pedestrian and bicycle safety program state funding and Eric Preston. Hello, Council President, Council Members. Uh, yeah, I'm Eric Preston, your city traffic engineer, and I come bearing money. Uh, it comes from the Washington State Department of Transportation, pedestrian and bicycle safety program. 
Uh, this program um, is entirely state funded, so there's none of the federal strings attached that we typically get uh, with our grant funding. Uh, there is a small local match required um, of $20,000, but I'll get into more detail on that later. Um, the total grant amount is $1.1 million, which is very exciting. Um, it does cover design and construction um, of rectangular rapid flashing beacons at four different locations um, in the city. And so here's a project map. Um, we have two locations um, up here on Central Avenue, just north of downtown, north of James Street. We have uh, two more locations on the East Hill, one on 240th, east of 104th, another here um, on 104th south of 256th Street. So I'll just go over these locations in detail. Uh, first, uh, 104th south of 256th. Um, just to orient you, you can look at the map there and see on the right side of your screen, we have Rite Aid, Bank of America, uh, the Asia Pacific Market. Um, on the west side of the street, we have Walgreens and Taco Time. And our preferred location is down there by the Taco Time, which is about 600 feet uh, from the signal um, near the market. Um, 104th has about five, la has five lanes uh, with over 18,000 uh, daily trips on it. Very heavily commercial area. And this will be halfway between the signals that are about a quarter mile apart um, at 256th and 260th. Then going north on the East Hill um, at 240th, east of 104th, um, you can see that the uh, U.S. Post Office is right here. And so we're planning to locate that, uh, that crossing right in front of it. Um, it's pretty hard to find a crossing in some of these areas with all the driveways. And so um, I think this will be a good spot uh, for that. 240th is five lanes with 25,000 um, ADT. Again, com heavily commercial area, and again, quarter mile between the signals that would otherwise be safe crossings. Um, down to Central Avenue, uh, this location is south of, of Novak is um, right here where we have an existing uh, crossing island. Um, I'll point out that on one side of the road you have the Alderbrook Apartments and on, on the other you have uh, Chandler's Bay Apartments and this is just, just south of Carpenitos. And so um, Central Avenue is five lanes here with 37,000 um, average daily traffic. Uh, commercial, residential area, a lot of mixed use um, and they're there's three quarters of a mile between the signals um, at 228th and at James Street. And the last location, uh, just a little bit south on Central Avenue, between Woodford um, and George. This is right in front of uh, Kent Memorial Park, you can see there. Um, this also has a, an existing island, um, if you want to go take a look at that location later. But um, also five lanes, 37,000 ADT. Um, this one also has a transit stop um, at this location, so it'll get get quite a bit of use. Um, so the cost, the project is estimated at $1,183,588. And we got awarded most of that, $1,163,588 with a 20,000 local match. So I am available for questions. Great job. Any questions for Eric? Good locations too. I think these are much needed. Council Member Michaud. Thank you, Council President. So. Great job. I like free money. Um, my one question is, there was a lot of talk from the community about putting one of these over by the Panther Lake Library on Benson. Is that going to happen anytime soon? Uh, we are actually pursuing um, funds for that. Uh, we met with WashDOT. It didn't fit well with this um, grant opportunity. But yeah, we're, we're still working with them on that. Is that right where we're okay. Just didn't want to forget something. So. Great suggestion, Councilmember Marshall. I know that several of us have had emails from residents in that area. So, wonderful. So, um, we have this before us to authorize and move to the consent calendar, and I'm guessing everyone is very happy to do that. Great, thank you. Great news. And something I'm always looking forward to hearing about is our quiet zone update. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Council President, member of the members of the City Council. I'm going to uh, provide you with an update on the quiet zone tonight. So things we're going to talk about tonight is the work we've done with the railroads, the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, we're uh, going to change our approach for crossing modifications and then we'll have specific updates for each one of the railroads. Uh, since our last update in April, we've continued to work with both the railroads on the crossing modifications. And as we've talked about before, 
the goal is to try and reach agreement with the two railroads for the quiet zones before we go to the Utilities and Transportation Commission and ask for permission to modify the crossings. Um, in addition to that, we've had some uh, discussions with the Federal, Federal Railroad Administration to talk about specific details related to quiet zones and the implementation of the quiet zone. Um, again, as I mentioned, um, the FRA has, Federal Railroad Administration has very specific guidelines for uh, what is considered risk reduction for the crossing modifications. And so what we've been proposing is to continue with the pylons that we've got out there. These are the uh, picture of uh, BNSF at uh, Smith Street. And our proposal is to continue using these for the quiet zone. Um, some of the challenges with these are is they, they require continual maintenance. Um, they are made out of plastic. They're fairly durable, but they do break and they do need to replace, be replaced on a fairly regular basis. And another challenge with this, excuse me, is if more than one pylon is missing, um, that could put the quiet zone at that crossing in jeopardy. And I just want to highlight here that these two leading um, pylons are missing, and that would be cause for the railroad to sound the horns through that crossing. So in discussions with both the railroads and the FRA, we've decided um, that we would be better off using a barrier curb. And this is a permanent installation. It's concrete curb. Um, it does have reduced maintenance costs. We will need to paint the curb every couple of years. No pylons to replace. Um, anything short of some sort, some sort of damage to remove the curb, uh, the quiet zone stays in place. And believe it or not, this has similar construction costs. Uh, those pylons that we have out there now are um, about $150 to $200 per foot to install. So um, this, this is similar construction cost for these. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the Union Pacific update. Um, so for the Union Pacific, uh, we, we were working with the railroad on coming up with uh, agreements on the road crossing modifications. And um, there was a disagreement between the Union Pacific Railroad and, this, and us on what crossing modifications were required. And um, they've actually gone to the Federal Railroad Administration and the FRA has required us to do another quiet zone diagnostic. So uh, we did that in June, so June 23rd. We met with the FRA and also representatives from the Utilities and Transportation Commission and the utilities, or sorry, um, WashDOT, UTC, uh, Union Pacific Railroad, and the city. So um, we unfortunately had to repeat the quiet zone process, or the diagnostic process. Uh, however, this was a, a very good meeting. Um, unlike the last diagnostic where we had some potential disagreements that we were going to work out uh, after the diagnostic, I think at this one, the really good news on here is that we are all, all in agreement on what crossing modifications are necessary. Uh, the new diagnostic will require us to issue a new notice of intent, which is a federal requirement, and we will also have to submit an application to the Federal Railroad Administration to establish the quiet zone. The same process we've gone through with BNSF. Um, this may have some schedule impact, but I don't think it's going to be significant because we can uh, go through this process parallel to the work we're doing with the railroad. Uh, as long as for the uh, BNSF update, uh, as I mentioned in April, we met with the, them right before the uh, April update, and we're still working on the, some of the details through the crossing modifications, although we do have general agreement for just about everything. So, uh, however, the change from pylons to barrier curb does require us to uh, resubmit our application to the Federal Railroad Administration. We've been in discussions with them, and they said that they can help us expedite that since it's a minor change just from the type of curbing, uh, and the rest of the quiet zone has not changed. So with that, that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer questions. So one of the things that we always looked at was that map that has the different stages. Where are we in that process? I'm not ready to give that update. I want to wait until we're finished with it. So part of the part of the uh, diagnostic meeting with the railroads and things that we had in, in June is uh, a comment period where we send them the notes, they make the comments back, and then we have the final basically list of things that we're going to need to do. And so that comment period ends at the end of this month. And so the next update, I'll have an updated schedule for you. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Fincher. Thank you. So will those, will there be a replacement of the plastic paddles at each of the railroad crossings in Kent where we have 
the yes. plastic paddles. Very cool. So we were planning on replacing those since those are the, the bases are getting close to 20 years old. We were planning on replacing those anyway. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions about the quiet zone? All right, thank you, Rob. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> All right, next we have the Maker Street Bridge deck, which um, sounds like it's some more free money or grant money. So welcome to Carla. And April. And April. We're going to present these Hi, ones. April. They are very much related. It's Perfect. pleasure to see everyone again. Uh, this is my first time coming back in the room to present in person, so it's very nice to be back. So tonight we want to talk about um, Carla Maloney is the design uh, engineer, uh, the design engineering manager. Um, so tonight we want to talk about two recent grant awards. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of preview of how we got here, and Carla's going to go over some of those details. So in late 2020, we became aware of this grant opportunity. And so we did uh, what we do. We looked at uh, eligible projects. Um, we looked at the eligible bridges, which uh, we have quite a few. Um, and the Meeker Street Bridge really did, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, rise to the top. It's an important corridor. Um, this is a key um, location on the eastern termini of the Meet Me on Meeker uh, corridor. Um, and so we decided that this was these two uh, projects on this were what going to be two that we applied for, and they were um, they were successful. So I'm going to let uh, Carla go over the design and the engineering details, uh, since this one is very much more on the technical side. Hello, everyone. My name is Carla Maloney, Design Engineering Manager. It's good to see you all back here in the office. Um, let me see here. So um, we have two different uh, grants that we, that we went after for the Meeker Street Bridge. Um, it is a, a known as a uh, the Green River Bridge, according to WashDOT, and it is a um, Warren Truss Bridge. The bridge was constructed back in 1958, so it's been in place for a very, very long time. And um, this particular uh, slide that you see here is for the grant that we went uh, after for the bridge deck itself. You can see that we have potholes along the bridge deck. We also have spalling. We don't have a great picture of that, but that's where um, the surface layers start to come apart and it creates more potholes. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and repair those potholes. And we're going to smooth out the bridge deck and we're going to put down a brand new surface similar to what we did on the 212th Street bridge crossing uh, Green River uh, a number of years ago. I believe that was in 2018. That project was also, that project we did try to go after um, the, the grant, um, but we were, un we were unsuccessful at that time and uh, we were very happy that we were able to get it for this particular project. So for the deck repairs, we received approximately $1.5 million and we expect to construct the, do, the, do the construction in 2023 or 2024. Um, and we'll likely partner the construction of uh, the deck along with our painting work that, we'll, that I'll talk about next. The other one is for the painting itself. And as you can see, there's a lot of red patches on this lovely green bridge. And those red patches are indicative of rust. Um, it's a term that we use is called rust pack. And what happens is over time when it's, the paint is exposed to the weather, the, uh, the, the steel starts to um, delaminate. It, it kind of flakes off in chunks and it has uh, an effect on the structural capacity of the bridge. And so that's the reason for why we want to go ahead and paint these bridges um, uh, during the course of its life so that we can help to protect it and get the longest service life that we possibly can. So what we're going to do here is we're going to find those areas that are rusted out like that. We're going to uh, clean them up. We're going to repair them as necessary. And then we're going to um, uh, put primer down and then paint it and we're going to call it good. So um, again, like I said, you know, um, by painting, painting the bridge, it helps to um, keep our bridge in good condition so that we can use it for years to come. This particular grant, we requested $3 million and uh, we got the $3 million for it and we're really happy about that. Um, we are expecting to do construction again in 2023 or 2024. So um, with that, we request that you accept this grant from the WashDOT Local Bridge uh, Grant Program, um, which is funded by uh, FHWA. 
Great. Council Member Thomas, you have your hand raised. Thank you, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. So I have a really dumb question that would probably be asked, I hope, by somebody out in the audience. Uh, if you've received this grant money, why does it take till 2023 to get it done? Because, I mean, you're talking first about the the decking and then, of course, the, the big job of getting that primed and all that stuff for the bridge to be painted. Is, that's a big job. But, I, I mean, it's 2021, 2023, two years. Correct. It what, takes, what's the right answer here? So one of the challenges is, is that, A, this is over a body of water. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're protecting the environment. And number two, bridges that were constructed during this period of time often had lead in the paint. And so we want to make sure that the entire bridge is encapsulated. Um, you've probably seen that in other bridges, maybe on the interstates or on other uh, washed out facilities where they have that covering and they have the scaffolding. We're going to have to go through that process. And in order to get there, we have a number of permits that uh -huh. we need to get through. And um, that's really what takes that, that period of time in order to get that project out the door. And, you know, like I said, you know, we could probably do the deck ahead of time, but we really don't want to impact our citizens more than we need to. We know that this is a growing community and we want to, you know, make sure that we are thoughtful about how we're impacting our citizens and the people who use, use the road. Okay, I've got a follow up, so I, <clears throat> so I'm trying to understand, so, if you're going to tear up the deck, is that like one lane at a time and it'll still allow traffic to come across there? Or do you shut down the bridge entirely? And I guess the same question would be for the painting. If you're trying to save, you know, the fish down below and all that, try to, the environmental stuff. Um, I mean, there again, do you shut down the bridge totally? We do have some flexibility with that. Right now, our grant doesn't identify whether we have to use one method or another. Right. But again, um, you know, um, oftentimes um, what we do when we look at a situation like this is we look at the comparisons as to what happens to the people who are using the, using the bridge. And, you know, we could do it in a way where we keep one lane of traffic and we alternate it, you know, um, either over the course of the project or some other methods. But what ends up happening is that the, the duration of the impact to the people is generally lengthened. And, you know, there's a trade-off between a high impact right. and a short duration or a low impact and a very long duration. And, you know, it works different for different people. And, you know, we'll be, we'll be testing the waters and having that conversation um, before we make our final decision. And, and I assume that you could also put a detour over to 516, get them off of Meeker Street, run them down to Washington and, and, and go that route. That would certainly work. That uh, is correct. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Council Member Boyce. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm just curious about the rust. I mean, it's kind of pretty much spotty, right? I'm assuming oh, you got to look at painting the whole bridge. I'm hoping not just where the rust is located. It at. is the entire bridge. Okay. Um, you know, the, you know, a photograph can only, you can only see it at a distance, but once you get up close, you'll notice that there's a lot of little pits everywhere, and we want to make sure that, you know, if we're going to be out there, we want to make sure we get it done and do it right. Yeah, um, I can, it'll be really nice once you get it done. We all be as soon as the gateway to Kent, right, to kind of fix the road exactly. and the bridge, it really be nice. So 2023 seemed like a long time, but I prefer to getting it right the first time. And, uh, you know, it's going to be some inconvenient, but the outcome is really going to be uh, a nice uh, part of the gateway to Kent. So mm -hmm. thank you. You bet. Council Member Cor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my question is um, about, like, we got the grants and the timeline is by December, 2024. Uh, it's basically like, you know, cost of everything is going up. So are we, in, you know, when are the RFPs going out and what is the anticipated basically a timeline? And do we think that this, this grant and 13% by the city going to cover that cost? So the 13.5% is the match for uh, design. And provided that we advertise a project by the end of 2024, it is fully funded by FHWA through the WASHDOT grant. 
So in addition to that, when, I, when we put together the estimate, I did put in an escalation factor to make sure that when we do, get, when we do advertise the project, that it does cover that amount. Thank you. Council Member Fincher. Thank you, Madam Chair. So since there's a time limit and considering how long some of the permits have taken, for instance, with Mill Creek, are we confident that we will have the permits within that period of time? It is something that we are worried about, and it is uh, for that reason that, that you know, we, received, we received this money just about a month ago, and uh, what we want to do is we want to accept that money and just get, our, our, you know, get on it right away so that that way we give ourselves the greatest opportunity to hit that goal. Thank you. Mm. All right, any other questions? All right, so we have the two items before us, the grant for the bridge deck and the grant for the bridge painting. Is everyone okay moving this forward to consent? Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, and I am just double checking all of the items here. It looks like we have made it all the way to the end of our presentations. So um, have a great night, everyone. Thank you for joining us and we are adjourned.